Wilcock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Kristen Harmel is here today. She is the New York Times number one best-selling author of the Book of Lost Names, The Winemaker's Wife, and a dozen others. Her books are read all over the world. They've been translated into 29 languages. She had a long career writing for magazines. She was a reporter for People magazine. And you may not know it, but she was actually started her career as a sports writer. I am so pleased to welcome the author of the Book of Lost Names, Kristen Harmel. And I will tell our viewers, if you'd like to ask Kristen a question, you can drop it anytime into the chat. Kristen, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Anne. It's such a pleasure to be here. I am so happy to see you again. I have to tell you, there is an art to writing historical fiction. I happen to love reading historical fiction I, because you're such a master at this. I know that there is probably this sweet spot between the history and the storytelling. So where does that, that lie for you? Oh gosh, that's that's a great question and a big one. Um, you know, I, I think you have to begin with the facts um, and you know, this isn't just me. This is a lot of historical fiction novelists I've talked to. We have a hard time reining ourselves in once we kind of go down that research trail. But I feel like the more facts you have and the more of the real story you have um, and the better grasp you have on all of that, the more fun you can have playing in that real world. Um, and so you do have to strike a balance between staying completely true to the factual story but bringing to life these characters that hopefully touch, move, and inspire the reader, which is what keeps you turning the pages and, and keeps you learning the facts and you know remembering these moments in history. This book was in inspired by a true story. We're talking about a young woman who had excellent forgery skills, among other skills, and what she did for Jewish children fleeing the Nazis. So I don't want to overstep. I, I don't want to give too much away because I hate when people do that. But would you follow <laughs> the thread that I just laid out and color it in a little more? Sure. So the Book of Lost Names, like you said, is based on real stories of forgers during World War II. Um, there was such an intricate, fascinating network of people who forged documents, which, you know, if you read historical fiction, you've probably read a lot of books talking about, particularly if you read about World War II, talking about, you know, the people who are on the ground doing the resistance work or people escaping or things like that. And, you know, I've read a lot of books like that. And that led me to begin wondering who were the people who were forging these documents they used to escape? So that question was at the heart of this story, which is the story of a female forger in World War II who kind of stumbles into the French resistance by accident and winds up helping save the lives of hundreds of children. So she winds up working with this um, mysterious, handsome forger named Remy in this small mountain town. And they're very concerned about the fact that in forging identities for these children, um, they are in a way erasing them. Um, they're taking away their true identities and giving them a new one. So worried about that, she begins to encode their names in a book they call The Book of Lost Names, hence the title of the novel. But when that book goes missing um, toward the end of the war, looted by the Nazis, it's not just the book that disappears. It's all the secrets that are hidden inside of it, including secret messages that Ava, the main character, and Remy, the other forger I mentioned, have been passing back back and forth. Um, but the book basically is gone without a trace until 2005, when Ava is a retired or semi-retired librarian working in Winter Park, Florida, and uh, comes across a mention of the book in the New York Times and has to uh, go to Berlin to see if she can find it and um, see if it contains the answers to these questions um, that she's kind of needed to know for the last 60 years. Kristen, I am really surprised you told as much as you did. So for anyone that hasn't <laughs> read this book, they really are going to want to read it. We have several questions, but I wanted, before, one is going to kind of piggyback on, on, on my next one, which is, okay, you cannot tell a book by its cover, but there's a real coincidence between your cover art 
and the real book you just mentioned. Can you take a moment and, and explain that? Yeah. So, you know, I really have to hand it to the design team at Gallery Books, uh, my publisher. It's an imprint to Simon & Schuster. They have knocked it out of the park with my last few books. Um, you know, you you it, you get lucky when you get a great cover, and, and I've had several. Um, so I'm thrilled with this. But the book on the cover of the novel um, is almost a dead copy of, I will show you this, the real life book of lost names. So the <laughs> look how close this is. It's, it's crazy. And, and, you know, I will hold it up. Um, look, you can see side by side. They look almost identical and even more extraordinary. Look at the spine. So they did this cool thing with the spine of this novel that kind of matches the spine of the real book. Um, but the cover designer had never seen the real book. So it was basically from my imagination to her imagination. And somehow we I don't know, met in that, you know, that cosmic mystical space and it all turned out exactly right. Um, but I do have to mention that the code uh, in the novel, The Book of Lost Names, was fictional. I just um, have this real 1732 religious text um, that I based it on. So, you know, if I was saying that there was a star over the A and a dot over the I on page 59, I was actually using page 59 of this book, which truly is printed in 1732 um, in the French language. And it uh, it's a Catholic religious guide to the masses. It's kind of interesting. That is so <laughs> cool, Kristen. I have a question from Facebook and um, it's about this book. And they want to know, will there be a sequel to the Book of Lost Names? That is a great question. Um, and the answer is probably no. I wouldn't rule out the possibility of writing a... Um, a short story or maybe even a novella um, following the story a little bit further. But, I, you know, I have a really, I have actually a lot of respect for people who write um, series. Um, I, to me, um, when I write my books, they follow an arc that begins and ends. And, and there I leave the characters. So to me, these characters have already been on their full journey. Um, I suspect the question is more about what happened to some of these children. Um, and that is something I would consider writing about one day, but it would probably less be a sequel and more um, just a jumping off point for a new story, novella, or novel. Okay, I've always said that words have power. Numbers also have power. And you just talked about the codes in the book, and that is the story. So this is totally out of my comfort zone, which is math. <laughs> but there is this, I will try to say, is it Fibonacci sequence? That yes, the Fibonacci only sequence. A math yep. is probably like you would know. So <laughs> math is also your thing? <laughs> Um, no, actually, funny story. Um, I imagined that math was my thing when I was a kid, and I used to lie in bed at night running the Fibonacci sequence in my head um, as my mental gymnastic preparation for the for my ultimate goal when I was like eight or nine, which was to be the first kid in the world to solve the world's unsolvable math problems. I mean, you you, you know, just just a modest little, totally realistic goal. Um, I mean, how silly, right? Um, <laughs> but you know, that was long ago. I'm, I'm 41 now, and that was probably when I was eight or nine. But when I was writing the book of lost names, I knew I needed to have some sort of code within the novel. And I went down every research hole possible trying to figure out um, what code would they, would they have possibly used during World War II? Something simple that two people would have come up with in a church library where they were working um, to encode these names and keep them um, safe, keep, keep it, you know, from being discovered. Um, and everything I came up with was wrong because they weren't going to be coming up with the same kind of codes that were being uh, formulated, um, you know, by the, by British military intelligence, for example. Um, and one day I was sitting at my desk and it was just like the light bulb went on and I thought, Oh my gosh, what about that Fibonacci sequence I spent a year obsessing over during my childhood? And everything clicked into place. So it's a relatively simple mathematical sequence where you add the two previous numbers to get the next number. Um, but that's at the heart of the code in this book. And I um, I have to thank my, um, my delusional eight or nine-year-old self for that. <laughs> there are two Facebook questions that are, that are, play on each other. And one is which character you do you connect with most from your novels? And we'll talk about this one. 
And also, who was the hardest character to write in this book? Those are both excellent questions. Um, I would say that the character I connected with most was the main character, Ava. And that's usually the case with my novels. Um, it, you know, when you're writing a novel, when you're writing it particularly from a person's viewpoint, you really have to climb into that person's head for the better part of a year and have them sort of take up residence in yours. So it has to be somebody you like and someone you can empathize with. Um, but I say that, um, I shouldn't say it has to be. I, it's most comfortable when it is. But I will tell you that in my previous novel, The Winemaker's Wife, there were three protagonists. And one of them um, was very unlikable at the beginning. Um, she had redeeming qualities that developed um, as she grew as a person. But that was a tough character to live with um, for a time um, and a tough character to have to figure out how to identify with. So that's always a, a real challenge as a writer. But in this book, it was Ava, the main character. As for the character who was most difficult to write, it was probably Ava's mother um, who... Um, has a lot of conflict with Ava because through the course of the book, Ava continually steps steps up to the challenge and steps forward into danger because it feels like the right thing to do. She's trying desperately to use her skills and whatever talents she has because she knows that she can use those talents and those skills to save lives. Her mother would prefer her to basically stand in place and do nothing because in her mother's eyes, that will keep her safer. Um, and so as that conflict between them grows, the tension between them grows, and the mother becomes probably to the reader, less and less sympathetic because she's actively working against all of these good deeds that Ava is doing. Um, but I, you know, as difficult as she was to write because I, I wished she was making different decisions, um, I think she was also a very realistic character to write because although I think we all wish that in times of great darkness, we would bravely step forward and do the right thing, um, that's not always the case. And, and you can't necessarily fault somebody for being terrified of, um, of what might happen to her child. She was, she was reacting with the love and fear of a mother. And, and I think her decisions were based on that, but it did make her a very difficult character for me to write. Kristen, you, if I haven't lost count, you have a fifth book about World War II that will be coming next. And you are so kind because you're gonna give us a sneak peek into what of oh, this this will be the sixth book we've written five first before we get into it what began this interest in telling holocaust stories and is it sort of like peeling an onion back because there's more and more to tell as you get into it yes i can't seem to stop i mean it's um i'm fascinated by that time period and by all the rich emotional, um, impactful stories from that time period that continue to have a message for us today. I, I think, you know, they feel, although they're, they're, you know, 80 years or 75 years past now, I think they still feel very immediate and very, um, very necessary. So that's kind of a part of it for me. It is very much like peeling back an onion and finding new layers. Um, what drew me initially to the Holocaust was, um, the fact that The Diary of Anne Frank was the book that impacted me the most during my own childhood. It was the book that showed me uh, that books can change the world and writers can change the world. Prior to that, I really thought books were for entertainment. You know, I grew up reading The Bobsy Twins and The Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew and these books that, you know, to me were just these fun romps. Um, so I, I wanted to be a novelist, but I also wanted to be someone who made a positive um, impact in the world. And Anne Frank taught me that that was possible. Um, so she really became uh, a part of my heart and a part of my story, which has always made me interested in the stories that surrounded her and her life. And then when I was working for People Magazine as a young adult in my 20s, I had the opportunity to interview a man named Henry Landworth, who was an extraordinary man um, who had survived five years in concentration camps um, from the age of 13 to the age of 18. And um, that conversation with him, the repeated conversations with him, and some of the things he said stayed with me and inspired me and became part of my first novel, my first Holocaust era novel, The Sweetness of Forgetting. Um, and once I started, I, I couldn't stop. Every, um, every book has kind of led me to another trail of research that leads to a subsequent novel. Um, 
and and it's been just a wonderful journey. I, I feel so lucky to be telling these kind of stories. You know, I, I, there I have done several, quite a few first person interviews with Holocaust survivors, generally when near Holocaust Remembrance Day. Yes. And we are at the point where yeah. these survivors will no longer be with us. So yeah. first it was, it is so impactful that you got to do yeah. this, that you spoke to them and that you are continuing this in, in your own work. And I just wanted to, to lay that out there. And now if you would give us a little taste of the new book. That was the perfect segue because, um, you know, I have to mention one of the people I got a chance to talk to for this new book, The Forest of Vanishing Stars, was a Holocaust survivor who actually lives in South Florida. Um, his uh, he He's one of the Bielski brothers, and the Bielski brothers' story was told um, uh, in great detail in a wonderful movie called Defiance, which was based on a book of the same name. He was the youngest of the four brothers who went and survived the war by living in the forests of Poland. And I did get to interview him as part of the research for this book, which was very inspiring. So the novel is based on the real life stories of Polish refugees, Polish Jewish refugees, who fled into the forests of Poland to escape the Nazi persecution um, and survived the war there. It's extraordinary. The Bielski group which I mentioned, um, numbered uh, over 1,200 by the end of the war. And the vast, vast majority of them survived and walked out of the forest when the war was over. Um, there were other smaller groups. Uh, this book I've written, The Forest of Vanishing Stars, is based on some of the smaller groups, but it's not based particularly on any one group. It's based on basically how they all um, came together and survived, which is just fascinating. So I'll read um, a, a very brief passage from the beginning of the book. This is from the first chapter. Um, and basically the story of the what went on in the forest is framed by a story of a young woman named Yona who was kidnapped as a um, on her second birthday by a woman named Jerusa who um, feels that she's been called there to Berlin um, by the forest itself to take this girl and to raise her in the wilderness. So she takes her from her German parents and spirits her across Europe to um, the deep, dark forests of Eastern Europe. So um, in this passage, this very brief passage I'll read, um, we're with Jerusa as she's about to take the little girl. It was the same light that had brought her here from the forest two years earlier. She had first seen it in June 1920, shining above the treetops, like a personal aurora borealis beckoning her north. She hated the city, a board being in a place built by man rather than God, but she knew she had no choice. Her feet had carried her straight to the Jutner's house to bear witness as the raven-haired Frau Jutner nursed the baby for the first time. Jerusa had seen the baby glowing even then, a light in the darkness no one knew was coming. She didn't want a child. She never had. Perhaps that was why it had taken her so long to act. But nature makes no mistakes. And now, as the sky filled with a cloud of silent blackbirds over the twinkling city, she knew the time had come. It was easy to climb up the ladder of the modern building's fire escape. Easier still to push open the Utner's unlashed window and slip quietly inside. The child was awake, silently watching. Her extraordinary eyes, one twilight blue, and one forest green glimmering in the darkness. Her hair was black as night, her lips the startling red of corn poppies. I have come for you, Jerusa whispered in Yiddish, a language the girl would not yet know. She was startled to realize that her heart was racing. She didn't expect a reply, but the child's lips parted, and she reached out her left hand, palm upturned, the dove-shaped birthmark shimmering in the darkness. She said something soft, something that a lesser person would have dismissed as the meaningless babble of a little girl. But to Jerusa, it was unmistakable. It is you, said the girl in Yiddish. Yo, du spinik, Jerusa agreed. And with that, she picked up the baby who didn't cry out and, tucking her close against the brittle curves of her body, climbed out the window and shimmied down the iron rail, her feet hitting the sidewalk without a sound. From the folds of Jerusa's cloak, the baby watched soundlessly, her mismatched ocean eyes round, as Berlin vanished behind them, and the forest to the north swallowed them whole. 
So that's just a little taste of the very beginning of the book. Oh, it's so unfair because I don't have the book to be able to finish it yet. So <laughs> I, I, I'm waiting. So that's, that's great. That is the upcoming book, The Forest of Vanishing Stars. When, when I read your books, there are a few things I know I'm, I'm going to see. I am going to have strong female characters. I, there's going to be threads of hope and resilience and courage and finding light in the darkness. What is it that you want readers to walk away with after finishing one of your books? Well, first of all, Anne, thank you. That was a that was a lovely way to put it and a very nice compliment. Thank you. That's that's what I hope people are getting out of the books. Um, you know, and and I I do think that I, I hope that if you walk away with a message, um, and particularly maybe a message that has resonated more in 2020 in the first half of 2021, as we've been struggling, you know, with this worldwide pandemic and with these strange times that have um, thrust us into very unfamiliar territory, I hope what you walk away with is the idea of not just the ability to find light in the darkness, but to be the light in the darkness. And the idea that you don't have to have anything special, you don't have to be any particular job or come from any particular place. Ordinary people like you and me, all of us have the ability to dig deep in these dark times and find that light, strike that match and illuminate our little corner of the world. But all those little sparks of illumination, I think, join together to to light up the world. I mean, so to me, that's a message that reverberates through a lot of World War II fiction. Um, I hope it's something you take from my books. And I hope it's something you carry forward, especially as the world is reopening and we're getting back to normal. Um, but I hope you you remember that, that anytime we face difficulty, we just have to be brave and dig a little bit deeper and do what we can for the world. When the world gets back together, I, I'm going to go and ask you about France, because you have okay. this incredible sense of place and, and how you describe yeah. places in your books. You lived in France. I believe, I believe it was Paris that you lived for, for several years. So one day when we are traveling again, what's your <laughs> ideal day in Paris? Um, well, obviously I'll have to bring you with me and we can just talk books the whole time, Absolutely. right? So Anne, yeah, are, are you up for this Paris trip? Um, yeah, I, I, so an I'll ideal day. In <laughs> I know it's, it's asking a lot of you, right? Um, yeah, it's um, an ideal day in Paris for me um, would basically be a day of doing nothing, which is terrible. There are so many extraordinary things to do in Paris, so many museums, so many historical sites. Um, but to me, the joy of Paris um, can be found first and foremost, just in walking its streets and eating its food and drinking its wine and just soaking in the atmosphere and smelling the smells and talking to the people. And it, it's just, um, it, it's the, it, I, it sounds silly to say, but it's the city that made me who I am today. I spent just a few months living there in my early 20s. I mean, I've been back many, many times since. Um, but it, it was a time period in my life that transformed me because it taught me to literally and figuratively stop and smell the roses. It taught me that life doesn't have to be a rush. Life doesn't have to be an uphill climb all the time. You can just stop and enjoy the moment and enjoy the little things. And, um, and uh, you know, sometimes when you're in Paris, those little things come in the form of a perfect baguette and some cheese and a nice glass of red wine. So <laughs> the day would probably consist of a lot of that. <laughs> I'm there. I'm there with you. Uh, we only have a little bit of time, but I did underline something in the very back of the book, and, and I'm going to paraphrase this. And it said, you don't need a big platform to change the world because something as simple as a pen and a little imagination can alter the course of history. And I loved that. And, and in the minute or so that, that we have, would you just talk about that and why you put that at the end of your book? Oh, well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, it's um, it's just an important message to me. It's it's that idea that we all have 
the ability and the responsibility to change the world um, in, in a way. Um, and, and, you know, maybe it, it kind of dates back to that discovery I made long ago with Anne Frank, that you can change the world with something as simple as a book by touching people's hearts. Um, but you can do that, you know, whatever your talent is, whatever your interests are, um, you can use those things for good. Um, and, and I think that's an important message because it, it's empowering, but it, it also is a message um, that, uh, that hopefully makes the world a little bit of a better place. It is such a beautiful thought. And as I said, I did, I, I underlined it because it, it, it really, it spoke to me. Kristen, you, we've looked at two books today and briefly because you just have to read them. There's so much in them. The Book of Lost Names, and the one that you gave us a sneak peek, The Forest of Vanishing Stars. So Kristen Harmel, I just wanna thank you for taking your time, spending your time with us today. This has been such a pleasure. It has been for me too. I'm so grateful for the invitation. It's just wonderful to be here with you, Anne. Wonderful to talk with you again. And thank you so much for having me. I'm Anne Bocock. Please connect with us and join me on the next between the covers.